Hi, everyone, and welcome to Dead to Rights, the podcast. I'm your host, Donna Carrick. I want to take a moment to thank our faithful listeners for joining us every week. If you're tuning in for the first time, please be sure to subscribe at iTunes or Google Play. And if you feel so inclined, a good rating would really help us reach more people. Our primary mission on this weekly series is to connect readers with writers and profile the exceptional work being done by both the well-known and the lesser-known authors. A few years ago, it became obvious to me that Carrick Publishing had grown and had managed to develop a fantastic and large network in the writing community. Our closest ties remain in the crime writing community, our first love being crime genre. However, those connections soon spread well beyond to encompass the greater web of literary and genre writers all over the world. We're very proud of the friends we've made and the fantastic community we've been so lucky to be a part of. Hence, Dead to Rights. We hope you enjoy our weekly short stories and author interviews. Today, we're thrilled to bring you our chat with a UK author who has achieved both accomplishment and stature, reaching countless readers in the historical mystery genre. I can't wait to feature Mr. Michael Jacks, author of the Knights Templar series. But before we get down to our Readers on the Run segment and our story, Appearances, I'd like to tell you about a fabulous book I've been listening to this week on Audible. No doubt you've heard of U.S. Senator John McCain, a.k.a. The Maverick. His latest and last book, The Restless Wave, is a deeply moving and honest look at his experiences in public service. Whatever our politics, and mine are often quite different from his, I can assure you, it is so refreshing to hear a voice that speaks with integrity, with honesty, and with a genuine desire to serve. If you're interested in politics, or if you just enjoy biographies, I highly recommend The Restless Wave. My most convenient form at the moment is Audible, but it's also available in print or e-editions. If you tuned in last week, you'll know that we spoke with Lizbeth Meredith, author of the memoir Pieces of Me, detailing her years-long search for her kidnapped daughters. Maybe I'm in a memoir frame of mind, because I'd also like to tell you this week about a soon-to-be-released memoir by my friend and a truly talented author and artist, Jonathan Santlofer, titled The Widower's Notebook. This book is coming out July 10th, published by Penguin Books. I haven't read it yet, but I've read a great deal of his earlier work, his crime fiction, and I can tell you he is a writer of merit by any standards. Of the Widower's Notebook, best-selling author Lee Child says, Wrenching, heartbreaking, intense and emotional, but valuable too. We are all approaching the age where this will happen to us. I don't know how Santlofer found the fortitude to write this, but I'm deeply grateful he did. I think the world is a better place with this book in it. I first met Jonathan years ago at a Bloody Words conference in Toronto. Through his work and his postings, I came to understand that fortitude is definitely a quality to be associated with him. I'll be reading The Widower's Notebook. I'll definitely revisit it in a future episode and give you an honest review at that time. Meanwhile, if you're listening in New York City, you should visit jonathansantlofer.com for a series of great events coming up in July. And now, stay with us for our Readers on the Run segment, featuring a story titled Appearances by yours truly, which can be found in North on the Yellowhead, a collection of crime stories, Carrick Publishing, 2016. Appearances by Donna Carrick No, that's all right, Val, Janie said. Life does, after all, go on. I'm glad you and Carmen thought of me, being in the neighborhood and all. Stop by and we'll have coffee. Janie put the phone down and glanced around the living room. It was still tidy from the other day. The kitchen was clean, but disheveled. She ran hot water and washed the dishes, starting up the coffee maker. Replacing the lid on a small bottle, she put it away in the cupboard. 
How did she sound? Carmen said. Quite chipper, actually, Val said. It's as if nothing happened. Did you see her the other day chatting with that handsome minister and his wife? Talk about keeping a stiff upper lip. Carmen shook her head. Everyone copes with these things differently, she said. I don't envy Janie, all alone in that big house. Shep was her world. Hmm. You disagree? Well, Val said, it's not like they were together all that long. She snapped him up like shoes on sale. You think she married him for his money, Carmen said? He sure as hell had enough of it, and she was dirt poor, working her ass off to make ends meet at that hole-in-the-wall bookstore. Her luck turned around, didn't it, Carmen said. Right after they married, she managed to line up an agent and a publisher, then winning that big literary award. Did you see Shep's kids, Lacey and Ron, at the funeral, Val said? How old are they? They're both still in university, so they must be in their early twenties, Carmen said. They barely spoke two words to Janie the entire time. Having such a young stepmother probably doesn't sit well with them. I wonder whether she'll inherit everything. I'm sure Shep provided for his children, Carmen said. After all, they're still in school. I'm just saying, the bulk of the estate will go to her, and from where I stand, she's not entirely lost in grief. Val pulled into a quiet neighborhood and parked on the street. Here we are. What a lovely house, Carmen said, studying the expanse of landscaping that led to the sprawling white stuccoed building. Through the living room window, Janie watched the women approach. She pulled her shoulders up, "'reminding herself to show a friendly smile. "'She'd never been fond of Val. "'On the other hand, Carmen was nice enough. "'Come in,' Janie said. "'Such a nice day. "'I was working in the garden this morning. "'What brings you ladies to my neck of the woods?' "'Actually, Janie,' Val said, "'we came to ask you a favor. "'And you came all this way? "'I'm glad. "'It gives us a chance to visit. "'How do you like your coffee?' That smells wonderful, Janie, Carmen said. Cream and sugar, please. Black for me, Val said. The three women sat in a breakfast nook off Janie's marbled finished kitchen. I've never seen your place, Carmen said. It's really nice. Thank you. Shep built it for Angie, of course. Everything was to her taste. But I have to admit, I'm fond of it. She had a decorator's touch. You've probably added your own style over the years. Not really. A blanket here, a picture there, Janie said. That's about it. Kind of strange, really, settling into another woman's surroundings. But my focus has always been my writing, so it's worked out well in that way. Actually, Val said, that's why we're here. The annual Canlick Conference is coming up. We need a guest of honor, and we're hoping you'll agree. Me? I'm stunned. I don't know what to say. Thank you. But that's in July, isn't it? Yes, we wanted to ask you sooner, but with Shep so sick, we'll understand if it's too short notice. No, it isn't that, Janie said. It's just that it's so soon after. I don't know. We have a couple of other names we can try, Carmen said. We were really hoping for you, though. I'm deeply honored. That's still two months away. Plenty of time for this old hack to pull herself together. I'll do it. You must have been worried not having the spot filled on the program. Frankly, we spoke to Mel Hansen a while ago. He was ready to step up if we couldn't get you. We'll ask him to MC the event instead. This is entirely unexpected, Janie said, and so kind of you. I'll be honored to accept. It's settled then, Carmen said. We'll add you to the program right away. Can we trouble you to throw together a bio, about a hundred words? Of course, I'll email it to you tonight. And we'll need five hundred words on thieves in the afternoon, Val said. You know, the creative process, the idea, that sort of thing. Janie stared into her coffee mug. That book had taken eight long years to write, edit, and revise. Dark years of sick obsession, lost in the literary dance of pathos and eros, good and evil, 
the seemingly endless struggle to create something real. Hungry years of scrimping, barely able to pay the rent on her meager salary from the bookstore, pouring every waking moment into an effort with no reason to expect a payoff. Few friends, no social life, no love. Then two more years given over to the hopeless attempt to break into a market that was too small, too closed to allow for entry by an unknown. In the end, it was only Shep's connections that brought her work to light. He helped her find a publisher. His name gave her exposure. For this and many other things, she would always be grateful. That'll take a bit longer, she said. How soon do you need it? Can you do it by Wednesday? I can send it tomorrow if you like. Perfect, Carmen said. Now we can talk about other things. How are you holding up? I'm okay, Janie said. The service went well. Shep would have been proud. The kids headed back to residence right afterward. Their semester is wrapping up. They have exams. They seem like nice kids, Val said. Yes, Janie agreed. Shep and Angie did a good job with them. You did a good job too, Carmen said. I hope they appreciate you. I often think I could have done more, Janie said but they were already in their teens when I came into the picture. They have their own ideas. We're not as close as I'd like. I'm sure they'll come around, Carmen said. It's this entire generation. They aren't maturing as early as we did. Eventually they'll realize how much you've done for them. I believe they will, Janie said. It's just that they're so busy now with exams and all. Well, Val said, I have a meeting this afternoon. Thank you for the coffee, Janie, and thank you for saving our bacon on the conference. We were counting on you. That's right, Carmen said. We've been keeping our fingers crossed. I'm glad it all worked out. If there's anything we can do to make it easier for you, just let us know. Don't worry, Janie said. This is the shot in the arm I needed after everything with Shep. There is no better validation of one's work than being honored by one's peers. Val unlocked the car doors and tossed her purse into the back seat. The two women were quiet as they pulled away from the house. When they turned onto the main street, Carmen broke the silence. I hate to say it, she said, but that was strange. I told you so, Val said. Even the kids couldn't wait to get away from her. Not a flicker of emotion. Very cold. Maybe it hasn't hit her yet, Carmen said. Maybe she hasn't faced it, that he's really gone. Maybe, but she didn't think twice about the guest of honor slot, anything to further the career and image. Do you regret asking her, Carmen said? Not at all, Val said. I'm as mercenary as the next gal. We need a big name, and Janie's about as big as it gets. Shep's death adds to the mystique, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Carmen nodded. She wasn't comfortable with Val's harsh judgment of Janie, but she had to admit there was something odd about the woman. Like everyone, Carmen had her own ideas about grief. Janie just didn't fit the bill. Janie watched the women drive away. She sighed. Her smile fell away like the lace of the curtain, leaving her face dark and drawn. They were good women, she thought. So kind and such an honor. They must have been nervous holding the position of guest of honor open so long. How could she refuse under the circumstances? Thieves in the afternoon was a runaway success, riding the New York Times bestseller list for months during the previous year. Excellent marketing by the publisher Shep had lined up for her, coupled with relentless interviews and appearances on her part, had lifted it above the rest. Shep would not allow her to give up. Throughout his long illness, he kept reminding her she deserved success. What did any of it mean without Shep? Ahead of her stretched only loneliness, more decades of writing in a void. Her heart was empty, drained from all those years of pouring its contents onto the page, rinsed clean by grief that no one else would see. Even Shep's children had deserted her. They'd never really accepted her, but if Shep had lived long enough, eventually they would have come around. Now it was too late. 
Janie reached into the kitchen cupboard and removed a handful of tiny bottles she'd been accumulating for the past few months. She lined them up on the counter, touching the lids lovingly. She paused for a moment, still unsure. That very morning she'd planned to swallow them all and end this misery. Now, though, Val and Carmen had come into her kitchen bearing a gift, the gift of kindness, the gift of respect for her efforts the gift of friendship. Maybe these things were enough to live for. Maybe friendship could carry her past this sense of hopelessness. She would invite the children to the ceremony. That might open the door to bring them closer. Carefully, she removed the lids from each of the bottles. She poured the contents into a bowl and carried them to the bathroom. She didn't dare leave them in the cupboard, where they might present temptation on another day. Janie dumped the pills and flushed them away. She had work to do. The end, and that has been appearances, my look at the way we judge each other, the way we judge grief in a world that is too often very sad. And now, let's get Michael Jex on the line. Michael is a writer of historical mystery novels. His Knights Templar series features Sir Baldwin Fernshill, a former Knight Templar, and his friend Simon Puddock, bailiff of the Lidford Castle. Michael founded the Medieval Murderers, a speaking and entertainment group of historical writers, and also helped create the Historical Writers Association. A member of the Society of Authors and Royal Literary Society, Jex was chairman of the Crime Writers Association in 2004 and five. I'm delighted to bring you this truly talented and fascinating historical writer. Hi, Donna. Good morning, Michael. How are you? And welcome to Dead to Rights. <laughs> Not too bad, thanks. I'm just walking up to my kitchen to make sure that these two flaming dogs don't carry on. <laughs> I have the same the <laughs> I have the same problem all you know the time. Like. Yep, kids and dogs, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So I have <laughs> to ask I you your first call a couple of minutes ago. I don't know what happened there. The phone didn't ring. I just oh. had a sudden bleep to say that I've missed a call. <laughs> well that's okay. I knew there must be something, so I, I was willing to try again, you know. <laughs> I have to ask you, though, how is your weather in the UK? Because I'm burning with envy of any place that doesn't have snow right now. Uh, no snow. It's just miserable, grey, wet. Uh, okay, okay. Then I won't, I won't be too jealous of you. This will not be a hostile interview in that case. <laughs> uh, you know I've wanted to talk. I've been chasing you down, and I apologize for that. But I really wanted to talk to you because ever since we met at the Bloody Words in Toronto a few years back, I've been fascinated with your series yeah. and with how prolific you are um, as a writer. Um, uh, Michael Jex, for those who don't know it, is the author of a medieval murder mysteries series. Actually, I think more than one series. How many series do you have right now, Michael? Yeah. Uh, I'm glad you asked me that. Uh, let's see, there's the Templar, the Bloody Mary, the Vintner trilogy, and the Crusader series. So that's four main series, and um, I've got uh, a modern-day spy thriller, which is a standalone, but I'm going to be writing a follow-up to that as well. Okay, so you're actually you're breaking your time setting. That's good. Um, but you've got over 40 oh, yeah. titles, is that right? Yeah, it's 43 now, I think. Forty-three. Okay, so I'm not kidding when uh, I say so when I say prolific. 30, there's, sorry, there's thirty-three in the Templar series. I've got a trilogy. I've got um, three on the yeah. So it, it must be forty-three now. Um, tell me about the Templars. Me. Sorry, Michael. Tell me about the Templars series because it's the first one that I was introduced to your work with. It's um, it's very little to do with Knights Templar, really, sadly, but. I was I, um, I was working as a computer salesman, and um, things were going from bad to worse in the early 90s because we had a minor recession down here in the UK. And uh, I'd been thinking for some time about writing a book, and then I happened to read a book in 93 that was all about the Knights Templar. 
And I thought it was just a fascinating read. It was Dungeon, Fire and Sword by John J. Robinson, who I think is American. Uh, historian, but he wrote a history of the Knights Templar from their very first inception to the end, and he just gave me this feeling for um, what would have happened to one of the Knights Templar after the destruction of the Order, mm -hmm. um, an awful lot of them just disappeared, and I thought that would be really fascinating to take that idea. And yes, how did they get absorbed into books. normal life? What exactly are the Knights Absolutely. Templar, for those who don't know? All uh, right. Um, it was a religious order that was created at immediately after the First Crusade, and it was set up by Hugh de Payon and various other guys, and their objective was to protect pilgrims on the way to the Holy Land. And that was the basic start for them. They were just um, guarding uh, pilgrims whenever they could. But um, they were viewed with real um, uh, respect by the Pope and other people, and so people started giving them money. And after a while, St. Benedict, I think it was, um, gave them a rule so that they could live by the same sort of rules as monks in the Benedictines. And they started collecting money hand over fist. And they were a brilliantly inventive mob because they were, for example, the first people to invent banking in mm -hmm. Europe so that you could deposit gold at the temple in London or in Paris and they'd give you a piece of paper and you could exchange that piece of paper for gold again when you got to Jerusalem. Oh, all, wow. with, all held within the Knights Templar. Mm -hmm. uh, a fascinating group. And they were very, very involved in politics and all kinds of um, silliness. But the trouble was that when the uh, Kingdom of Jerusalem, when the last aspects of that with the city of Acre were taken back by the Muslims, the Templars really didn't have much of a reason for existence <laughs> because they obviously weren't the pilgrims for them to protect. Mm -hmm. So... The French king was hard up for money, and he decided he was going to have his share of the Templars' money. So he brewed up some really obnoxious uh, allegations against the Templars and had the order uh, all arrested on the same day, which was Friday the 13th of October 1307, uh, which is where Friday the 13th, the, the idea of that being a bad day, comes around. Hmm. Um, and he had all of them arrested um, over the next few years, a large number were um, tortured. They were forced to admit to ridiculous crimes they couldn't have admitted. And when they tried to recant, they were burned at the stake. So they didn't have much of an option. But um, as I say, the main thing for me was that my guy, uh, Sir Baldwin, I had him as a Knight Templar because I thought as an investigator in a crime series, he would be ideal because he would have a big world view. He would have lived through various battles. Um, I had him surviving the Siege of Acre and... 1291, um, he, he was involved in politics, he'd have seen the Pope, he'd have seen Rome, he'd have been all over the place. And I thought, what a fantastic investigator for small rural crimes if I set them in Devon. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, he'd be the worst investigator on the planet because he wouldn't have the faintest idea about the local customs <laughs> or the laws or the local people or anything. I thought, oh, hell, I'd better find someone else to work with him then. <laughs> yes, yes. So he, he <laughs> then has a sidekick. And tell us about his sidekick. That's um, a guy I invented called Simon Puttock, mm -hmm. and I like the name Puttock because it's an old Anglo-Saxon name. I've got a friend whose name's Puttock, and um, it's an Anglo-Saxon term for when a falcon um, rises up on, on the air and pauses, uh, ready to swoop down and pounce on a rabbit or something. That's called Puttocking, when he's up there just hovering. Mm -hmm. um, I thought, that's interesting. And mm -hmm. I was looking through some uh, old records and I found a guy called Stephen Puttock. And I thought, well, he's interesting because he was a 1300s man. He was um, very early 1300s. He was a peasant who was born as a serf to the Bishop of Ely. So he was basically a slave. He was owned by the bishop. <coughs> and, but by the time he died, he owned three flocks of sheep, a whole range of cottages that he was renting out. He owned two sheep pounds. Um, and he was really doing very nicely. And the bishop thought this was great because he took 10% of everything. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, when I checked into it, I thought, this is just the ideal character because he was a bailiff for the bishop. He would have knowledge of all of the laws, all of the local people, everything. He'd have records of all the tax they'd paid. He would know, really, you know, the inside leg measurement of every peasant on his patch. And I thought, that's the sort of person I need. So I invented this guy, 
Simon Puttick, so I didn't yeah. take his name in vain completely. And, and, it absolutely, and uh, it absolutely ties to what I wanted to ask you about the challenges of researching for this time period, because you and I spoke before about this, and I know it's just extensive. Um, you can get caught up and addicted to the, the research, can't you? Oh, yes. My good friend Bernard Knight always says that he hates writing, but he's had to write lots of books because he really loves researching them. <laughs> 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 and that, that is part of the trouble is, you know what it's like, you start researching and you get stuck into it, and really it's, it's trying to find that point where you say, look, I've really got to stop now, I know enough. Yes. Because there's always that little extra detail that you can go for, isn't there? It's there's like pulling a thread, more. and the thread just keeps pulling and pulling, and it leads to another thread yeah. that looks kind of interesting. And uh, for anyone who hasn't got uh, caught up in goes, research... Unless it goes wrong, I have had situations... I mean, there's, um, if you've got a couple of moments, there was um, one... I mean, I always find it really next to impossible to think up new stories, uh, new names for books. I can... I can think up the book, I can write the book, you know, 110, 120,000 words is not a problem, but if you ask me to encapsulate that in three words, I really find that difficult. Mm -hmm. And I just once had this brilliant idea, I thought, I'd call this book Widdicombe Fair, because not many people necessarily know of Widdicombe Fair in Canada, but over here it's um, a very popular name because the fair is still going, it's a popular, lovely little town in the middle of Dartmoor, Widdicombe. But uh, it was made famous by a song, um, and it's all about Uncle Tom Cobbley and all going to Widdicombe Fair. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought, that's a good one, because everyone's heard of Widdicombe Fair because of the song. So I suggested that to my agent, and she said, yes, good idea. And she told the editor, and she said, yes, it was a good idea. So I went off to the British Library, back in the good old days, with the old round room. And I sat at a powder blue leather desk on a powder blue leather chair with all these wonderful books all around <coughs> and started researching. And I spent seven days up there and couldn't find a bloody thing. <laughs> 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 I thought, that's not much good. So um, I came back down to Devon and went to the archive office, the uh, Exeter University. I went to the uh, Devon and Cornwall Record Society, uh, Devon and Exeter Institution. I went everywhere I could think of and couldn't get another, couldn't find anything for another five days. So in the end, I spoke to the, one of the archivists and said, look, can you help me? I'm trying to find out this. And she said, yeah, I, I can't, she said, but um, if you speak to the cathedral librarian, he knows everything about history. I'm like, fine, mm -hmm. fine, okay. So I phoned him up and I said, hello, uh, I'm trying to find out what I can about Widdicombe Fair in the 1320s. And he said, you'll find that difficult. And I said, yes, why? <laughs> he said, Widdicombe Fair started in 1820. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> You're just trying Which to prove the fake news, the that's all. Fake news, fake threads, it's all the same. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of other aspects to this kind of research, too. Um, there's the time period, of course, and the human customs and mores, um, but there's also the forensic yeah. knowledge, the lack of it, and what would pass for that type of uh, investigative knowledge. Um, there's weaponry. Criminal motivation, which may yep. or may not be in some ways the same or different, um, yep. and the approach that uh, investigators would take to their work, all of these things, and they all have to be sort of sorted through and, and figured out. And Yeah, but the good thing is that if you're going back in time to my sort of period, then really you don't have to worry about too much of that. You've got um, certain records, the coroner's roles still exist. I mean, if you wanted to, the number of written records there are about peasants and so on in the early 1300s, it would probably take you more than a lifetime to read through them all. There's a lot of records still in the UK. <coughs> but um, although there were keepers of the King's Peace like Baldwin, um, each of them was given a warrant that was the same that said they had to hunt down felons from... Um, from parish to parish to hundred to hundred. So they were the people who were effectively the sheriff of the day. They were the ones who would raise a posse and chase after um, any malefactors. Um, but within that, none of them would have actually got, you know, they weren't given a rule book of this is how you do it and this is what you've got to do. They didn't have, uh, as the police do over here, the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, PACE. Mm -hmm. So they didn't have to worry about exactly how it was that they apprehended someone. I mean, basically, if 
if you found someone who had abjured the realm, if you found someone who was um, basically going into voluntary exile, and you found that they'd strayed off the path that they'd been told to take, literally the path, because they weren't mm-hmm. that very good at communications in those days, then you had the legal right to behead them. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> very, very straightforward in those days. Then yeah. went, okay, well, but now I've got to read you your rights, because he didn't have any. He was an outlaw. He was mm-hmm. out of the law. He had no rights. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There, there was a case I found where a guy um, was literally found in the woods near the road and he was supposed he was told that he had to take the road uh, to go from a to b um because he had been found to be a criminal he had admitted his crime so he was told to abjure the realm go into exile and the coroner told him the route that he had to take he <laughs> he was followed by uh, i assume the victim's family they saw him leave the road so they beheaded him oh boy and they, they were told off they were told off afterwards. They were told they shouldn't really have done that straight away. They should have given him a time to come back. But, um, yeah, it was legal. That was fine. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, uh, a, a cynical person might say, I wonder how far he really went off the road, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I wonder if he did go off the road or if um, the, the victim's parents or whoever it was decided that um, I'm sure he would have gone off the road if he had had a chance. He was thinking of it. He was thinking of it. You could tell by his shifty yeah. eyes. <laughs> yeah, he had a shifty look in his eye. That's right. That's he right. Stepped on the branches on the road. <laughs> yes. Now you've got a brand new series that's underway, and it's uh, in the mid 14th century. Is that right? And it features Edward the Third's exploits on the battlefield. Um, what's the title well, of that that's series? My... Well, that's my Vintner trilogy, and um, basically what I was trying to do there was. Um, my editor suggested that I might like to get away from crime for a little bit and write some war books. Mm-hmm. And so I wrote three crime three crime books, but set around warfare. Of course. <laughs> <It's not laughs> but uh, it's basically Band of Brothers, but set in the Hundred Years War. So the first book, uh, Fields of Glory, was set in the campaign around Cressy. And then the second one, Blood on the Sand, was based around the Siege of Calais, which happened immediately after the Battle of Cressy. And then the third one was ten years later with the Battle of Poitiers, which is Blood of the Innocents. And it's it's a nice little series, actually, because it gives me a chance of looking at what life was really like in those days for a Fintane, a platoon, effectively, of archers. And um, it's from Grand Ars, who's the commander of... 100 archers and effectively his vintner Berenger Fripper who is the commander of the 20 men in the arching archers and uh, all the different men in that band Mm -hmm. and uh, the nice thing is that okay you had an awful lot of excitement through the Cressy campaign (coughs) and then after that with the second book there was the siege of Calais but there were also a lot of other things going on at the time which I managed to get my poor devils involved in Um, but then there were 10 years between Calais and Poitiers and the reason why it was such a long period was because they had the Black Death in the middle Mm -hmm. so I then was able to look at what happened to each of the guys and their families and so on and what motivated them to go back to war and uh, then look at how they reacted to the war itself. And what what did motivate them for the most part? What would have motivated the, the majority of the men to go back to war? I think with an awful lot of them, um, I once heard it described um, in a history of the Hundred Years' War, uh, which said that um, for most of the people involved, they treated it like a joint stock enterprise. It was, mm-hmm. it was just a business. They were going out to France and they were robbing any monastery they could find or convent. Uh, they would rob any merchants. They would steal everything they possibly could and bring it back. And there was an awful lot of people who made themselves multi-millionaires, effectively. Mm-hmm. So Sir John Fastolf, for example, was a common knight when he went out to war. <clears throat> but when he came back, he, he showed himself to be quite brave. Um, he captured a lot of French knights. There was this lovely concept in those days of if you capture a, an enemy knight or a lord or an earl or whatever it might be, then they had the principle of chivalry-involved uh, ransom. So you you capture a foreigner, you don't kill them because you don't have their worth money. Right. Uh, what you do is you hold them and then you ransom them back. And it was such a big business that um, 
the Black Prince, for example, was regularly buying up ransoms of French knights from his men because he could hold them. He had a better set of um, prison guards and so on. He could hold them, and uh, he'd probably be able to get a much better ransom for them than his uh, common sergeants or whatever mm-hmm. they might have been would have done had they held on to them. So it was a, it was a big racket. I mean, for a lot of the guys, it was just money. Yeah, um, yeah, what we would now but, call a boondoggle, uh, really. really. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, basically they, they were pretty much mercenaries going out on their own count. That does, that ties yeah. into what I'd kind of read in my very limited research about the period, too. Um, you know, if you were from a very poor family, I guess you would see it as a job. And if you were from a little bit better yeah. off family, you'd see it as really your financial adventure, you know. Absolutely. But um, even if you were a poor man, I mean, there was one guy went out there as... He was a cobbler's son. He was little better than a peasant. Um, but he managed to get himself knighted, and he ended up the most powerful man in Italy for quite some time. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing like to chaos to, to give everybody an equal <laughs> footing, is there? <laughs> um, John Hawkwood. John Hawkwood, that's the one. Yeah, he went out um, as a very unimportant person in the Hundred Years' War, learned how to fight, learned some tactics, and then became leader of... Uh, a really unpleasant group of mercenaries in Italy and ended up marrying the, um, the patrician of the city's daughter. And he's even buried now in the Duomo in Florence. Wow. And there's a delightful um, picture of him on his horse. <laughs> oh, uh, directly above where he's buried. Yeah. But, um, yeah th- there were fortunes to be made if um, you were bold enough or potentially lunatic and vicious enough. <laughs> yes, yes. If you, if you were... Um... Uh, oh, there was a word on the tip of my tongue. If you, if you, really, if you had the balls, I guess, to just throw caution to the wind and and fly out in some strange place. And the other thing is, it's um, you know, there's an old saying that a prophet is never really revered in his own hometown, and I think that's the same for the yeah. cobbler's son. He's not really revered in his own hometown, but you throw him into another setting, and if he's got the guts, um, he can be anyone, really, can't he? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, this was. Probably the first time since William the Conqueror when British men had an opportunity of changing their, their stars like that. Mm-hmm. But, um, it was an incredible time. And it also meant that it was pretty much the end of peasants um, and servility in this country. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's really when the British national character started to be formed, I guess, because it get, I mean, before the Hundred Years' War, um, all business in government, for example, was conducted in French Mm -hmm. because it was a hangover from William the Conqueror. Of course. But during the Hundred Years' War, English became the national language, full stop. There was nothing else. Mm -hmm. It's Mm -hmm. um, a radical change. Uh, One of the things I did discover in my time doing research is when I was just really starting out writing (coughs) was um, an event in Exeter where there was a bit of a, a brouhaha in the high street and um, it escalated into a full-scale riot um, after a, not very long. Uh, and the thing that happened was there was a couple having an argument about buying some stuff at the market. One of them was um, a local Exeter man who was probably speaking some form of Middle English or Saxon. And uh, the guy that was arguing with him was from Cornwall, who spoke much more sort of Welsh Celtic. Um, language and so various people from the stalls tried to get involved and um, stop the argument. Two of the characters that got involved, one was um, a Dominican friar who started um, trying to persuade him to belt up, another one was a canon from the cathedral and they both spoke Latin Mm -hmm. absolutely fluently, not necessarily any English. So that didn't help matters and then some guards came down from the castle to see what was all what was the uh, cause of all the trouble. And they, of course, spoke Norman French. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so the riot kicked off purely because no one understood a bloody word that anybody else was saying. I really <laughs> often wonder how Europe ever survived those those days because um, just moving from one region to the other, you'd have no no handle on the, on the language at all or the customs, really, would you? No. Yeah, yeah. Now, I noticed no, when I was... When uh, think about... Sorry, go ahead. So, I was going to say, when you, when you think about um, pilgrimages, when you had people going from um, deepest Cornwall all the way over to 
um, Santiago de Compostela or going beyond even even to Jerusalem. And they had to pass through so many countries, so many different languages, so many different types of um, money. Mm -hmm. Even just thinking about the most basic things. Yeah. And people are always surprised when they see that uh, knights used to carry pewter with them all the time. Well, mm -hmm. the reason was it was very easy to pawn pewter. <laughs> <laughs> if you got hard up for cash and you were stuck in the middle of Germany, you, you had something that you could sell into cash. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that would be just absolutely critical to have something that is uh, mobile that you can bring with you that you can trade, um, really. And, yeah. and how the language got seeded all over the world has always fascinated me. And if I had another lifetime at my disposal, yeah. I think I would dedicate it to figuring out how the language um, really seeded itself all over the world. Um, things like uh, yeah. the Chinese word, the Mandarin word for mom, of course, is mama, which is the same as the French word. Oh, you know? I didn't know that. Yes, yes. Oh. And uh, baba uh, is father, which is pretty darn close to papa, you know. Yeah. Um, I just, I find the seeding of languages just to be so fascinating, but that's digressing, I know. One of the things I noticed when I was um, doing a little bit of research of my own is that you and I were born in the same yeah. year. I won't say what year, and that makes you way too young, way too young to have over 40 titles to your credit. <laughs> so I need to know, uh, what, which of your teenage years did you first start writing novels? Mm, yes. Well, when did I start writing? You say sorry. Yeah. When did you first uh, start well, writing? I wrote my first book in January of 1994. Okay. And it was literally January because I'd lost my job. I told you that there was a big recession going on. Mm -hmm. um, I had 13 jobs in 13 years because every firm went bust. Mm -hmm. um, two of those jobs were five years each, so you can add up the rest of for yourself. Okay. Uh, but uh, yeah, I've, I've been working at Wordplex, then Wang Laboratories. Um, and all sorts of different companies. And uh, it all went belly up, basically. So I thought after 13 jobs that somebody was trying to give me a significant hint and maybe it was time to find a different job. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, as I said, I, I'd read this book about the Templars. Um, I invented these two characters and my wife said, look, I'll keep the mortgage going. You just write this bloody book. So oh, I'll, wow. <laughs> wow. That, that's fantastic. Uh, uh, thank you, wife. <laughs> Because you are an exceptional, you're an exceptional writer, Michael. And I, for anyone who doesn't know of your work, please rush right out and look up Michael Jacks, and in particular the Templar series, but also the new one. Say the name of it again. Well, there's the Vintner trilogy, mm -hmm. but um, the other ones are the Bloody Mary series because they're all set around Mary Tudor, mm -hmm. Queen Mary, and. Uh, Pilgrim's War is the latest book, which is the first in a new series all about the Crusades, oddly enough, which is going to develop, it's going to grow into a saga based around the Templars. And your titles are fantastic. I'm to go back. Your titles are fantastic. I mean, you said earlier that you had trouble coming up with titles, but your titles are fantastic. <laughs> Did you have help? Because I really, I really <laughs> think of them. Normally <laughs> there you go. So you have to have a good editor. That, that was my editor. And that I think you. That was the editor. <laughs> yeah, I think you probably were really motivated to see your writing in some way as as a business, given the recession that you were in and everything. What advice can yeah. you give to new writers, especially those interested in working in in your genres, um, about how to break in and how to treat their art as a business? Well, the first thing you've got to realise is that it is a business. You're self-employed. It's not something you can treat as a hobby. Um, so my first advice to anybody would be to do the same as I did, which is get rid of the TV. Because mm -hmm. if you want to be a writer and you need to break into it, then you haven't got time for TV. Um, when I said I wrote my first book in January of 94, I mean, I literally wrote a 100,000-word book in one month. Mm -hmm. uh, it because I was working seven days a week and I was working stupid hours, but I needed to prove to myself that I could actually write a book yeah. and finish it. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing I'd say is do not follow any social media because it's the easiest way of just eating into any spare time to write that you've got. Mm -hmm. And it is distracting, and distractions are the killer to anybody who wants to write a book. Mm -hmm. um, but beyond that, I'd say just make time, sit down and write because yeah. the easiest thing in the world is to go on courses, buy books on how to do it and everything else. And at the end of the day, 
you don't need a course and you don't need advice. Mm -hmm. What you need is an idea for a story and to find the time and write it. Yeah. Uh, that's the most important thing. Just sit down, get on with it. <laughs> and this is the same with any goal. I mean, I've, I've had friends in my younger days. Now I've kind of learned because um, I'm an Aries and I like to do things on my own anyway. But um, when I was younger, yeah. you know, I always thought it would be cool to do certain things with girlfriends or whatever. You know, we'd go hiking or we'd go walking and invariably time and again the friends would say oh that sounds like a great idea i'll order some special boots or i'll do this or i'll sign up yeah. for that and i'm like hey i just want to go for a walk like you know I mean, yeah. let's just no open the door them. and you step outside <laughs> yeah exactly and it is it's the same with absolutely every goal you've got people just start doing it you will find out if there are special things yes. you need along the way um, but most yep. things you just don't need. You just need to go do it. At, at the end of the day, people used to do it with a pen and a piece of paper, and the pen didn't even have uh, instant refilling ability. You had to dip it every two words. Yeah. And it took time, but, um, you know, they could do it. Yeah. We haven't actually changed as a species that much. No, and I've Mainly often thought a lot of the beauty of the language is lost because our fingers fly. I know my fingers fly. I'm guilty of that. Yeah. Um, you had said about writing a book in a month. People, it can be done, and it can be a good book, but I'll give you a little bit of a word of advice. When I wrote mine in, one August while I was on vacation, because I work full-time, um, one of my books I wrote during the month of August, actually we were on a three-week vacation, but I had already done seven months of research in advance and the outline. So I, you know, I really knew what I needed to write. And yes, it needed editing after, but it was structurally pretty sound because the pre-work had already been done. So do you plan your books in great detail? Uh, some I do. Some I do. I would imagine that yours take a lot of planning just because of the time periods and the plots and all that. Am I right on that? No. No, uh, I, I tend not to. I, I start with the scene and start writing. Um, okay. I, I did with the first book, the first draft of that, I knew exactly who was the guilty party at the outset of the book. Mm -hmm. And uh, it came obvious after a couple of weeks of writing that it was so blatantly obvious to me it would be to any reader too. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. Uh, so I, I threw that plan away and I haven't planned a book since. For I've me, it depends what I'm writing. Um, I've had, I had one novella that just sort of appeared on the page as an automaton yeah. writer almost and that was perfect because the, uh, the really the story was already completely painted in my mind I didn't have to outline yeah. anything it was really all there I had another one where I had the beginning the beautiful beginning and my whole critique group was just wowed by the beginning and I had the end and again they were wowed by the end and I so I started to write the in between you know because I had to do that um, so no, that one was not particularly plotted. I sort of knew where it was going because I had the final chapter written, edited, polished, and I had it in front of me. And I literally was typing in between the first and last chapter. So I always had the final, and in fact, I called it the final chapter. I didn't give it a chapter number because I knew it was the final chapter and I knew that's what I was aiming to, you know? And that worked out well, but with uh, one of my books, Golden Fishes, the one that I wrote in three weeks, yes, it was planned to the nth degree because it was about a real event. Yeah. It was a fictional story about a real event, and I wanted to give it the proper justice, you know? So. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, different people, it works different ways. I know Stephen King never plans any book. He never mm -hmm. has a synopsis. Mm -hmm. He always starts from the beginning. And uh, J.R. Tolkien, when he was writing about... Uh, well, he, in his diary, he notes that uh, he's completely confused one night because he had written this scene in a bar and a tall, long-legged bloke turned up called Strider and he had no idea what this character was doing there or what he was going to do with him. And, of course, he ended up being the most important character in the book. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Well, that often happens with me. I don't know if it does with you. A character just kind of yeah. appears in the doorframe of my mind and just leans there and looks at me and says, what the hell are you going to do with me, you know? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and I've got to, I've got to have that character. The of writing, that's, um, you end up with, if you invent the characters well enough, then they will start to take over. Yeah. And it's not because they're real characters in any way, but you just know how they're going to respond to different stimuli. Yeah. And so whatever you throw in front of them, they will respond properly. If you, my fear always is that if you've got everything mapped out in extreme 
detail to the nth degree, then it won't read right because you'll be tempted to change their natures to suit the plot that you had. Yeah, yeah. So I'm always happier having everything unplanned. And the other thing is I'm fascinated with the fact that life really doesn't work that way. And uh, one of my objectives sometime over the next couple of years is I want to write one of those um, absolute chaos books, you know, where... (laughs) You open the door in the morning thinking you're going to do one thing and damned if the world just doesn't take over episode after episode after episode, because I'm fascinated with the whole concept of chaos and, and chaos is a real thing, you know? (laughs) It is in my house. (laughs) Oh yeah. Same here. (laughs) I mentioned the dog, the cat, the kids. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I really want, I really appreciate you coming on the show, Michael, and thank you very much for coming on Dead to Rights. I hope I'll get to see you again. I, I was so sorry when Bloody Words was um, had, had its final, uh, final, uh, you know, because so many good people that I had the chance to meet over the years, and uh, it was just a great drawing card for them, you know. Yeah, I loved it. I really had fun there. Yeah, same here, same here. But maybe something new will come along, and I'll get to see you again. That would be great. Oh, I hope so. Yeah. Thank- I, I have a need to get back to Canada. I haven't been for a while, and I've got friends in Vancouver and uh, in Rossland and the Rockies. And in Toronto. Uh, You've got a friend to in Toronto. Again. Donna in Toronto. There you go. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Stay with me for a second while I just turn off the recording. Yes, sir. Thank you to Mr. Michael Jax, author of the Knights Templar series and a number of other series, for joining us today on Dead to Rights, the podcast. I hope you've all forgiven my cold. I'm sure it's been obvious to you throughout. However, you know the show must go on. You can find Dead to Rights at deadtorights.ca or at our Facebook page. Our Twitter handle is at deadtorightspod. We'd love to hear from you at carrickpublishing.com or at our Carrick Publishing Facebook page. You can find me, Donna Carrick, on Twitter at Donna underscore Carrick, or at my website, DonnaCarrick.com. Join us next week for another great author interview and another great Readers on the Run segment. Our Dead to Rights theme song is Eyes of Gold, composed and performed by Ted Carrick, who also brought us all original story scoring music. Thanks for joining us. See you next week. A dusty road, a man alone. Sons go on hold, and I don't know what you've been told. But the years have turned my eyes gold, and I told you what you told me we'd never be in the same boat for free. Yet it rides, let it rot.